you you talked about moving from uh-huh. from Baltimore to Florida. Yeah, man, bro. How did that come about? I bro. wish you tell the listeners how that came about. So that was a tough one, man. Um, so. Uh, true story, uh, moms and dads, you know, uh, my mom and my dad, um, they didn't always vibe, right? They didn't always see eye to eye. And sometimes that lack of vibing manifested itself with screaming, arguing, yelling, fighting, bumping. You know what I mean? It, it sometimes it was it was really bad. Sometimes it was perfectly fine, normal, peaceful. Uh, sometimes it was mad tense in my house, like like mad uh, tension in the air. And so, when I was a little kid, I was probably about seven years old at the time. So maybe a year or two removed from the bike incident, um, which my dad taught me how to ride. My dad's good people. You know, I love the brother. Uh, me and him have reconnected in my later years. That's great. Uh, and uh, he remarried, man, and he really had just shown up really well in his new set of children's life. He had some children that he brought in uh, that, that they weren't his, you know, biologically, but he was their dad. Uh, they called him Pop Pop. And let me tell you something. Um, I made a joke earlier about how my mom, to me, was a different mother to my sisters. And, and I meant that, but I was kind of joking. My dad was a different human being qualitatively speaking James to the people that he brought into his home uh, him and his wife the, those people then I got to experience to the point where and I don't know how to explain this no other way bro it was an honor for me to watch him be pop pop to those children to those young people that was maybe 10, 15, 12 young, years younger than me pop pop was a good dude you know what I mean? And so we all have our journeys, man. We all have things that we have to learn through and grow through in order to become who we're supposed to be. My dad needed the experiences that he had because they inevitably brought him to be pop-up, pop-up in the lives of about five or six young people who now get to go out and based on that upbringing and that background and that whatever, they get to go be new versions of that in the world we all benefit from that I, I believe that kind of stuff man so at the time prior to the incarnation as pop pop uh my dad came home he had been gone for a couple days um my mom this is the retelling that my mom told me I, I was i do not recall this firsthand this is a story that she's told me a thousand times growing up he comes home she is um downstairs in the kitchen they have an argument where you been where's the money what about this what about that why are you always nagging why are you always oh somebody get off my back back and forth back and forth household stuff starts get thrown around and in the middle of that they stop they look at each other my dad goes and lays on the couch um passes out right sleep tired whatever my mom's sick of it and my mom, James, she decides that this will never happen again. And she decides to take uh, them little red gallons of gasoline. She decides yeah. to take one of them and burn him in the house up. What? True story. So, wow. so yeah. So she was like, this will never happen again. And in the moment of her collecting the things that she needed to do that, she kind of had like this moment of clarity and she felt like something like internally was like, you're not crazy. So did, did he get injured in the fire? So people what happened when she heard that, like that voice, I guess, or whatever, that nudging that was like, you're not crazy. You're not crazy. She packed me and my little sisters up the next morning, put us in the car and drove until she felt safe. She hit the highway. We were living in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, because she hit 95 and drove until she couldn't drive no more. Ain't really too many places to go after Florida, if you think about it. Um, Did you guys have family there? Or that was just nah, man. We were we, we were we literally stayed in a homeless shelter. Literally stayed in a city rescue mission. Literally lived in a car for a little bit. Literally had you know in a grocery store in the summertime, James. They have them white styrofoam 
coolers that you take to the beach or whatever, to the park or whatever. Yeah. That we had that in our car. We kept bologna and cheese in there, um, and ice and stuff like that. Like that lit I literally recall these things. I re- I remember being on the highway leaving Maryland in my school uniform. I remember when she didn't go down the street that was supposed to take me to the school and me saying to her, Mom, you missed the turn, but fully being aware that I should, like, uh-uh, don't say nothing. This ain't the time for that. My middle name is Christopher, right? My family called me Chris. And so I kind of like, Chris, this ain't the, I knew it wasn't the time for it, but I still said it anyway. I, I kind of let her know that I realized something ain't normal about this day. We hit the highway, bro. It was snow on the ground in Virginia. And I remember the snow being dirty and on the highway and me sitting in the front looking out the window. I remember all of that, man. So, yeah, we got to Florida and uh, we were homeless. We sh- we had a house and mugs in Baltimore. You know what I mean? And so. For- talk about break, talk about a change of cycle. My God. <laughs> yeah, man. So all of that. So, go ahead, man. Go. So when you were so. Florida, I mean, like, how old were you when this happened? Because seven, I, I wasn't, seven and a half going on eight. So I know that had to be a hell of an adjustment. It messed me up, dude. I was, I was one of those kids, man. I was really, really good at school. I had like a, like a sponge kind of brain. I absorbed everything in my home life. This is, dude. I've done maybe 10, 12 years work in the educational field as a consultant, as an education, as a t- educator, as a teacher. Um, if you're if a child's home life is not conducive to stability, to study, to simplicity, to having food and access to those things, it's almost like the school environment is pouring into a bucket with a hole in it. And so, my home life, although my parents were in and out, back and forth from my birth till I was seven before we left Baltimore, which led us up to the story I just told you. It was stable enough where I was getting my work done. I was eating every day. Yo, we were poor up here in Baltimore. So I remember, dude, we used to eat these rolls. My mom used to bake these like she had these little tray of rolls that she would make that we got from the store. And she would take them out the oven. She would rub the stick of butter like on top of them or whatever. And we would sit there and pull them things apart. And all of the wispy steam would come out of there. And it was crispy and buttery on top and soft. And I loved them things. Dude, wow. one, one day I was talking to my mom, maybe in my teenage years. And she was like, you remember how much we used to struggle? I'm like, yeah, I remember. That. She was like, remember we had nothing else to eat but those rolls? I'm like, no, nah, what rolls are you talking about? She was like, you remember we used to eat them all the time. I was like, I don't remember not having nothing to eat but rolls. But I was like, I do remember it was these one kind of rolls. Man, we used to eat them so much. Why we don't get them? Though? She was like, Chris, that's the rolls I'm talking about. I didn't know that was struggle food, dog. It never occurred to my childhood self at four, five, six years old that when we ate those rolls, we wasn't eating nothing else. <laughs> it was just good to me. Children don't know nothing about their situations. So for your folks that's listening, if I, as a parent, as an uncle, as a teacher, as a grandparent, whatever, if I give love and consistency out of what I have, not wealth, not millions, not brand new car house, if I give love, stability, and consistency, your children are going to grow up and have a good life. They're going to come out of a good foundation. If you give them money, if you give them brand new, the Jordans and the Xbox and all of those different things, but it is not accompanied with consistency and love and stability. We are producing inadvertently unbalanced kids that go out into the world and you only can give what you got. So if I have unbalanced, I'm going to give unbalanced out into the world. I'm going to make other people's lives unstable. I had a very stable foundation in that period. And um, it was beautiful, dude. It was beautiful. Wow, man. And that's- I tell you that's that's seven. That's a lot, man. Dude, you're talking about going from the north to the south. To the south. And from here, you didn't have family, so it was just basically you three. We struggled, man. A lot of alone. So when I said earlier that moms was like, "Don't go nowhere. Don't talk to nobody." 
it was because the only way she knew how to keep us safe for so many years was to just keep us right there. There was no aunt, no cousin, no, no, go here, go there. Um, the church that we was involved in was the most stable institution in my life because from the city rescue mission to the time I graduated, graduated high school, I was in a different school, James, every year of my life. For t like, I'd, I never spent more than two school years in a single school. It was always moving. And there was a couple of years of my life where I was in two or three schools in one year. You know what I mean? And so it was just tons and tons and tons of instability in that regard. And her way of controlling that as best she could was to like completely lock. Talk about overprotective. And I understood it, uh, which is why I had to figure out how do I also live and breathe? Because that would have been stifling. Like, how do I? I learned how to control her stress levels. I, I learned how to help her regulate and de-escalate. I learned how to kind of help shelter my sisters and, and, and keep some of the normal annoying kitty things that uh, that children would do. I learned how to be a barrier against that for my mom so that she had reprieve. You know what I mean? And, and, and all of that kind of stuff has its opportunity cost. You know, it gave me and my sisters a very bumpy relationship for a while you know what i mean so was i big brother or was i kind of like little daddy you know what i mean was uh and then for my mom was i son was i child or was i like confidant was i like partner was i like i can't cook dinner go make dinner for your kids so that sort of thing man it had its cost you know what i mean it's things that we had to work through and all of those stories bro everything that i just shared to you in part or in parcel is in this book